Okay, so perhaps you got a new camera for Christmas or for your birthday or for your anniversary or maybe even for lockdown and you're doing really well with it so far. Automatic mode is giving you some really clean, nice photos, but maybe you wanna push it that little bit further. Maybe you want a bit more flexibility and you just don't quite know where to start. That's cool, man. Everybody starts somewhere. So today I'm gonna to give you three camera basics. So hopefully you can put some of that into practice and start expanding your photographic repertoire. Let's go. Okay, first things first, don't be afraid of the auto setting. It's not that bad. It's really good at determining what lights around you and making an educated guess as to what settings to make the camera use. But what it can't do is tell you that your subject is a bee rather than a human and that bees move faster than humans, for example. The whole principle of photography is about collecting light and cameras do this with a delicate balance of mechanical amazement and digital wizardry. So we're gonna go through that today. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about is shutter speeds. So let's get these into manual mode, indicated by the M on the top dial. We measure shutter speed in seconds and fractions of a second. So typically a one 125th of a second is likely to freeze movement. We can set shutter speed like this on older Canon systems, and we set it like this on newer Canon systems. Now, you can set it how you like on your particular system, but because I've got Canons here, that's what I'm gonna show you. It should be the same. You're looking for the one slash and then the uh, longer number after it. That'll set your shutter speed. 125th of a second is gonna freeze slower, smaller movements, like a handshake from when you're taking a picture handheld, walking down the road, or maybe even talking, it'll freeze your lips, right? So the faster your shutter speed, the faster your subject can be. So if we take a motorsport photographer for sake of argument, they might be shooting at something really high like 4,000th of a second or 8,000th of a second. And that allows them to capture really fast moving objects, of course. And then on the other side of things, we've got the landscape photographers that might use an 80th or a 60th of a second, maybe even a full second, maybe even 10 seconds. But of course at that speed, they'd be on a tripod because you don't want any of the movement to come through, right? So this process is controlling the amount of light hitting the sensor by opening and shutting the shutter at different speeds. Now the trade-off here is the longer the shutter's open, the more light you're getting, which can blow out a photo, or the shorter the shutter's open, the less light you're getting, which can underexpose a photo. So our second component, aperture, that can help us control that light even further. The aperture determines how wide the iris in your lens is open. And we refer to this as the f-stop or the f-number. Now, typically most lenses run between around number two and number 22. And the values look like 2.8, 3.5, 4, 5.6. They're a funny bunch on a funny scale. But the thing to remember is that the lower the number is, the wider your iris is. And conversely, the higher the number, the smaller your iris. So this is how we set it on an older Canon system. And this is how we set it on a newer Canon system. So if you're using a wide f-stop value like a 2.8 or a 3.5, what that's doing is it's allowing the lens to focus on the subject and anything that is not the subject will be blurred out. So that portrait mode you have on smartphones, that is mimicking a low f-stop value. And so what we're doing is we're isolating the subject from its background because it's in focus and the background isn't. As you go through the aperture values up to higher values like 16 or 22, what tends to happen is you get more of the field of view in focus from front to back. Now this is quite useful in landscape photography where they might opt to use a 16 or a 22 value in order to get that front to back focus of whatever landscape they're taking. 
But of course, here's the trade-off. So the wider the aperture, the more light is going to be let in, and the smaller the aperture, the less light is going to be let in. So say, for example, you want to take a photo of a fast-moving object like a bee, but you want it isolated from your background, what you might opt to do is use a fairly high shutter value, like a 500th of a second, but a fairly low f-stop value, like a 3.5, in order to isolate the bee against its background. So if you took that photo, what you might find there is that you've still got quite a bit of darkness going on. Even though you've got a wide aperture letting a lot of light in, you've got a fairly fast shutter speed not letting a lot of light in. So we can compensate for that with the third part of all of this camera basic stuff, which is ISO. The ISO value or ISO value determines the sensitivity of the sensor inside your camera. And we can refer to this as gain. So if there are any audio nerds or amplified musicians getting into photography, this one, gain, we're in a similar, we're in friendly conceptual waters here, okay? So the higher the number, the higher the gain. And ISO values typically run between the number 100 and the number 1600 or 3200 and anything in between. Now some cameras will go to lower ISOs and some cameras will go to higher and some will go to higher and lower, but we'll forget about those for the moment. We're interested in the 100 to 1600 or 3200 range. Now, this is how you set ISO on an older Canon system. And this is how you set ISO on a newer Canon system. So let's take the example of our B. We wanna shoot him frozen in time isolated from this background and we want to render a nice bright image. So at the moment we've got 500th of a second shutter speed, we've got a 3.5 aperture value and we've got a 100 ISO value. So when we take that photo we may discover that actually it's not rendering, it's struggling to render a very bright image. Okay. So what we can do is keep the other two settings the same and increase our ISO value to 200. Now we're starting to see the brightness come through. We've already got the sharpness from the aperture value and we've then got the stillness from the shutter speed value. So what we want to be careful of with ISO is that if we go too high to an 800 or maybe even 1200, we might start to blow out the image. And blowing out an image means that it's overexposed, which in real terms means that it's too bright. It's too bright to render something aesthetic and something nice to look at, okay? So if even in our example where we've got 500th of a second, 3.5 aperture and an ISO of 800. If that's rendering too bright, then we can bump it back down to 200 and we should have a nice image coming from those settings. The other thing that you wanna be careful of with ISO is if you're taking photos in a dark area, like indoors, you can start to introduce noise into the image. Now, the audio nerds that have got on board with this gain idea will know that the higher the gain on a microphone preamp, the more noise you're gonna get coming through the cables. It's exactly the same theory with image, except the noise is uh, rendered as pixel artifacts on your sensor. So it's just something to be aware of. Let's have a quick recap. Shutter speed is the mechanical process which allows light onto your sensor in varying timeframes. The faster your shutter speed, the more motion you're gonna freeze. The slower your shutter speed, the more motion blur you're gonna have in your image. Aperture is the width of the iris inside your lens, and the wider the aperture, which means the smaller the f-stop number, the more separation you're gonna have between your subject and its background. The smaller the iris, or the higher f number, the less separation you're gonna have, and the more depth of focus you're gonna have throughout your image from front to back. ISO determines how sensitive your sensor in your camera is, and so the higher the ISO number, the more sensitive it is. As with everything artistic, all these foibles and quirks of motion blur, of depth of field, and of noise in the image, they can be exploited to create something new and interesting. But you've got to know the rules before you can break them. Thank you so much for watching. If you want any more tutorials like this or any further development skills that you want me to go through, make yourself known in the comments and I'll get around to you as soon as I possibly can. I'd absolutely love it if you wanted to join the band by subscribing and I'm really happy that you came to watch today. I'm even happier if you learned something new. So I'll see you in the next one.